sugar varieties are transversal when they intersect. And now this makes clear why over the complex number it's simple to compute it. Because transversality over the, over the complex number for complex cycles is very stable. But over the real numbers, it's not this stable. Okay, so this is why it's difficult. So this somehow quantifies quantifies uh, the amount of transversality. Okay? So let me draw a picture. So this is maybe the first one and this is the second one. Okay? This is the second one. Uh, so what we can, and this is a point of intersection, okay? At this point of intersection, somehow we could, uh, now, almost, 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 so we have a normal bundle of the first one and the normal bundle of the second one, okay? So now this space here is a tangent space for the gross making. So now, what is this uh, average angle? Is the expectation of the volume of the parallel epipede generated by these normal directions. So somehow like uh, the more, the less transversal they are, okay, the more these two directions tend to be parallel and this is just intuition, okay? The smaller is this uh, object, okay? So, and uh, this is really what enters in the integral geometry formula. So we have uh, uh, in this picture just two of them, but in general what we have, we have uh, n many of these directions. Okay. And you can assume they are all at the same point because uh, the group itself is able to, to be one point to the other point. Except that now that these are random, okay, and we want to compute the expectation of the volume of the, in fact, the average volume of the parallel epipede generated by them. Okay? The average volume of this. So this is the quantity that enters into the internal geometry formula. And it's the same quantity over here, except that it's very easy. It's just like a complete <laughs> average angle okay, between two vectors on the sphere. Do you have a question? Yeah, but this volume is a determinant of something. It is, I agree. Yes. So how do you see the determinant in this? In this specific, first of all, it's the modulus of the determinant. Okay? In this case, just in this specific case, uh, it's uh, a Gramian, right? So if you, we have two vectors in the plane. Okay? So now the what is the area of the parallel epipede in this case? The, of this, it's another description, like the product times the cosines. So that's correct. So that's a, that's the modulus of the determinant. Okay. So this is actually what's happening. So the geometry of this step here is this. So what we have so now, the, just a picture here. We live in the big tangent space of the Grassmannian. Okay. It's some big R n, but it has some structure, and that's important. And we are computing, as you are saying, the expectation of the modulus of the determinant of the matrix whose uh, columns are these vectors. Okay? Maybe that's my mother. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's correct. So now what is interesting to note is that, like, what is the distribution of these vectors? Now, I, I told that, like, uh, these Schubert varieties, they are very special normal space or tangent space, okay? So now these vectors, they belong, so the tangent space of the Grassmannian has a structure of some matrices. In this case, it's a matrix of size 2 times n minus 1, okay? And what we do actually, we sample these points independently and uniformly from rank 1 matrices, okay? on of norm 1, okay, okay? So if you want, we take the set of uh, rank 1 matrices, we intersect the hemisphere, okay? That's, uh, in, that's somehow like a, how uh, to say, a um, sub, subset of the, of the Grassmannian, okay? We take uh, this, uh, the tangent space, sorry, take the uniform, new uniform measure and we sample it this way, okay? That's a very, very weird problem, okay? In the case of the sphere, when we do integral geometry over the sphere, what we do is the same. So we can do integral geometry over the sphere, integrate many of them. We do the same thing, except that now the matrix here turns out to be filled in with mean zero variance mark Gaussians. Now this is much more complicated matrix. Okay? But here now is another step that appears. So this expectation is, a, if you want, two different ways. Either we could view it as a random variable, or we have like the orthogonal group, the stabilizer acting. Okay? 
and this is the and we are averaging over these many copies of the stabilizer. Okay. So now here is another trick here. So I would say so this average angle is this one. Now here there is another very interesting statement. Statement about like a convex geometry. We have these like uh, random vectors in our n sampled according to some distribution. Okay, we have n many of them, and they all have the same distribution. We sample independent, we put them into a matrix. The distribution isn't here, but for now, forget about distribution. Okay, so it turns out like the expectation of the modulus of this determinant up to a constant is the volume of a convex body. Okay, that's obvious. Any number is the volume of a convex body, but this is a very specific convex body. So this turns out to be n factorial, just a constant times the volume of a convex body, and this convex body is somehow like the average of these uh, line segments. To be more precise, uh, the support function of the convex body, so it's a function that characterizes convex body, if you don't know what it is, I'm going to spend maybe a few seconds, it's at a point uh, is the expectation of the support function of the line segment from 0 to 0. So this by itself fix is a convex body. Well, this is a convex body. It's just a segment. Okay? But it's random convex body. It's, I can define its support function at a point and take the average because it's random. What I get is a function of u. Okay? This is the support function of C, of this new convex body. So this convex body somehow is obtained as averaging. It's the picture that we want, right? Somehow, like we are we are these are random, okay? And the thing is that like the 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 the, the determinant one is the volume of this convex body, some kind of average shape of this determinant. Okay? For for what is the support function, by the way? Just to see the visual picture. The support function describes, characterize a convex body, and it's defined this way. So this is the convex body in general. So you give me a point, this is the point uh, u. You want to know what's the value of the support function at this point. You take the direction determined by u, you take the plane orthogonal to this direction tangent to the convex body, the support function is uh, this distance divided by the modulus of u. Okay, so somehow like it gives uh, the distance of the of the hyperplane tangent to the convex body in the direction of u. And it characterizes the convex body. So in this case, this is a this is a this is a, this theorem here. It's a theorem which is almost a forgotten theorem by Vitale. It's a very, very useful theorem, actually. So, still, like, this is just uh, saying something abstract, okay? <coughs> but uh, here, now, we get a couple more uh, magic that happen, okay? So, maybe there are questions at this point? Oh. What kind of body it is? Yes. Uh, for example, for the simplest problem. Yeah, I will, t I will tell what's the, what's the support function, okay? And actually telling you what's the support function, you will see why there is a new miracle happening. Because at this point, this is nothing. It's the volume of convex body. Okay, fine. This convex body is in a very large dimensional space. How do we compute its volume? It's O plus. Okay? But this looks like a Laplace method uh, technique. Okay? So this is what happens. I'll tell you what's the volume of the support function. So in this case, U is an element in this space. So it's a matrix. Okay? And we can talk about its singular values. And because it's a 2 times n minus 1 matrix, it has just two singular values. I mean, denote them sigma 1 and sigma 2. Okay? So here's the support function. So h at a point, so this is a convex body here, at the point u. So now u is a matrix, and the singular values are sigma 1 and sigma 2. So this is 1 over the square of 2 pi, just a constant. And then the expectation of sigma 1 squared psi 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared, psi 2 squared to the one half, where psi 1 and psi 2, they are independent, mean 0, or in 1 Gaussian. So we take a, so what this is, a, this is an elliptic interval. It's exactly an elliptic interval, because like, if you divide by sigma 1 squared, so like, Expectation with respect to mean zero, mean zero and one Gaussians. You could do it in polar coordinates. Okay, so this becomes a, so these are two independent Gaussians, mean zero and one real Gaussians. So this expectation is actually an integral in R two. Okay, you could do it in polar coordinates because the radial part doesn't matter. So in polar coordinates now becomes something like integral of square root of ratio of these singular values 
times uh, sine square. Okay, so it's very difficult uh, integral in this case. But there is one point about this integral that you see the support function of the convex body only depends on the two singular values. A priori, it's a function of like these many variables, two times seven minus two. But in this case, it only depends on these uh, little many variables. Okay, and moreover, there is some geometry happening here. So this makes sense even for also for a subset of just R2, not for a subset of these matrices. Take this function defines a convex body in R2. Let me draw the picture of this convex body. I have a picture actually that I want to draw on the blackboard and maybe show you. So you start with the convex body in the tangent to the grass minor, which is here. Correct. And now you... And now I'm drawing, I'm using, so I get the support the function which depends only on the singular values. Now I draw a convex body in R2, which is I just take this function and then draw the convex body in R2, just, just the, the function of the two singular values, okay? Mm -hmm. And here is the convex body that I see. I, have, I want to make sure that it's, the, yes, it's something like this. It has this shape, this convex body. It's in R2. So that's the convex <laughs> body whose support function in R2 is given by this. Okay. It's very, very difficult to compute this function. In fact, in fact it's an elliptic interest. Right? I don't know if you buy this statement, it's impossible to compute it. I mean, it's just here, but it's a elliptic So now what is the interesting thing is this. As you pointed out, this is a convex body in this big dimensional space. Okay. What it turns out is that our convex body fibers over this convex body. Okay. And the important thing is that the radial function of our convex body, so the function that tells the distance at every point from the origin, is the radial function of this convex body raised to this power. Okay? So how to compute the volume of a convex body? Well, we have to integrate over the sphere the radial function. That's what we have to do, just classical geometry. So here we have to integrate over the sphere. Ah, that's good because the sphere now can be described as like a, can, we can switch to singular value, singular value coordinates. But now we have a function that depends on the singular value, but we don't know what it is. It's the radial function of this convex body. We go to the singular value coordinate, but like what is the function? The, another secret is that the function turns out to be a power of this of the radial function of this of this body. This is now I would I don't want to say it's almost computable, but like a for using Laplace method, it's good because we, we have to invert some power series, we could do it. But what is the philosophy here? So we have a, an integral over this many variable that gets reduced to an integral over a function of just two variables with some high power. A function raised to some high power. So the function is the real function of this, and then, of course, the change of variables to singular values. So this is why it's possible in the end to compute these asymptotics. Like the asymptotic of this convex body is, uh, it can be computed using Laplace method. In fact, uh, even this part is tricky because uh, we don't have the radial function, we have the support function. So we have to do some type of like, uh, some type of, we have to kind of like uh, find an inverse of a power series, but Laplace method is very powerful because you only need approximation at a point to get asymptotic. And then approximation at a point, you just have to approximate this convex body at a point. And like, this is what like, actually makes everything uh, uh, computable. And this is what happens uh, in uh, all these cases. Like in all cases, like uh, Grassmannian of k planes in Rn, you do the same thing. You got a convex body. The support function of the convex body is some type of elliptic integral. And the, the, the volume of this convex body can be computed because in the end, the radial function is the radial function of a convex body in a fixed dimensional space raised to a large power. You can use again some type of Laplace uh, approximation to compute this uh, asymptote. I have, uh, so I want to say one more, maybe spend five more minutes, okay? First, I want to say one thing. That this can be done also over the complex numbers. All that I said can be, and of course over the complex number, you maybe know the answer. But uh, it's interesting that we can compute it in this alternative way. The thing that like, uh, we don't know is, uh, is there a convex body over the complex numbers? Over the complex numbers, it turns out like this average angle, it's not the modulus of the determinant, but it's the modulus squared of the determinant. And it's very easy to compute this expectation in this, over the complex numbers. Over the reals, that's a difficult, that's a difficult part of the story. But this can be computed, the volume of the sugar varieties can be computed, and everything can be done over the complex number in a kind of like a computational way, okay? 
So what I see about this uh, that is interesting is that somehow, like, uh, if we are just if you want to compute uh, the cohomology ring of the Grassmannian, that's kind of complicated. If you give me a Schubert calculus computation, so if you want to know, I don't know, for example, like uh, cohomology product of I don't know this times uh, some complicated make this complicated, okay? So this is kind of complicated. But somehow what I'm saying is that if you take uh, the full codimension, like just want to count points, uh, you can you are ignoring kind of like the structure of the Grassmannian, and you can just reduce it to this type of computation. Maybe also Shogala will say something about this uh, on this problem. And now I want to finish going back to the case of uh, E4. Okay, so now the case of lines in uh, in P3. Okay, so it's E3. Case of lines in P3. <coughs> I want to finish noting something interesting. So let me go back now to, so now we said this E3, it's the number of lines intersecting four given lines chosen at random in RP3. So this number itself, it's complicated. It's an iterated elliptic interval because it's this average interval. It's the volume of the convex body corresponding to this problem. And it's something like 1.72. Okay, it's a network that we did. For now, I just want to keep this as a, a constant. Okay, I want to explain the role of this, of this number. Is it more, more or less the volume of the hyperbola? It is. It is the volume. But the problem is that uh, it's difficult to compute. So it's not just now one elliptic integral, but it's some kind of iterative elliptic integral. Actually, we have a very nice formula for writing this volume. Okay, but um, for now I just want to suppose we don't know what is this number. Okay, I just want to explain what is the meaning of this number. I want to draw a very interesting conclusion. Okay, so here is the problem. Uh, let me take now four lines, no longer curves, lines in three space. So uh, uh, no, uh, no, curves, no, no, curves, lines, but curves. <laughs> exactly. Gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, and gamma four. But not algebra curves, just rectifiable curves. And of finite length. Okay? And you know the length this way. So I can ask for this problem. I'll make, so now take a random translate of this curve and ask for the expectation of the number of lines intersecting all these curves. Okay? Before I tell you what's the answer. Uh, let me maybe notice some very analogous problem, which is classical. So let me take now complex curves in CP3 of degree D1, D4. These are complex curves in CP3. These are Riemann surfaces, okay? So these are real surfaces. And let me ask for the number of lines, complex lines. We're not talking about this, we're just making one analogy here. Number of lines in C3 uh, intersecting all these y1, y2, intersecting y1, y4, all at the same time. And then it's assumed that like this y1, y4 are in, generic, in general position. So this number, again, can be computed using the Schubert calculus, and it is 2 times the problem decrease. Why is this? Well, the interesting thing is that essentially, like a number of lines intersecting a given curve, it's a it's a it's a Schubert cycle. It's a multiple of a Schubert cycle in the cohomology class, and it's d times the classical Schubert cycle. So this effect, like it's two times the probability degrees, it's a consequence of the of the fact that like the cohomology of the Grassmannian is a, as a ring structure. Okay. And by the way, let me write it down in a different way. So that's C two. Cut the second cut on C4, sorry. Okay. Times, uh, well, times uh, these degrees, but the degrees I want to write down it in this way. So times the volume of the curve, so the surface area divided by the surface area of CP1, surface area divided by the surface area of CP1. So the degree of a complex curve equals its surface area. That's a statement from complex algebraic geometry. It's called Birtinger's formula. 
Okay, so now I want to go back to our problem. So I'm giving four rectifiable curves, not algebraic, just rectifiable, and I want to compute the average number of lines intersecting all these four bytes. Of course, okay, average number of lines, lines intersecting comma one, comma four, all at the same time. Well, this is the answer, which is a yeah. complete analog to that. So this is E2, uh, E3, sorry, that's also, we are in two-dimensional space, okay, E3, so this number, times length of gamma 1 divided length of RP1, length of gamma 4 divided length of RP1, okay? So the, somehow these are, uh, it's a general statement, not just for like these curves, you could ask in general, like you have a, it's for all like this type of incidence problem. So somehow this is like a ex, like kind of like expresses like a, this quantity as the key quantity that governs the uh, questions in like a random incidence geometry. So I will stop here by just noticing and like a, the way I could see it is that it's some kind of like a, it's not a ring structure of course, but it, somehow like the problem gets decoupled into the linearized problem. And then just a problem about like uh, how big are these curves in our space? And you could uh, you could like formulate a general problem, and the answer is always going to be: suppose you have random, you want to study random incidence problem, give a bunch of su of uh, sub manifolds of finite uh, volume, okay, maybe of different volumes. Now ask for the number of k planes that are incident to each one to some order, okay? The answer is linearize the problem. And compute the average answer over the using like this average supercalculus times the normalized volumes of the manifolds you are taking. So somehow, like when you switch to an incident problem, the problem decouples into the linearized, ver linearized version, which is this uh, random supercalculus version, times problem volumes. Okay, we'll stop here. So, uh, that just your uh, stabilizer is uh, when you fix the points on the curves. Mm then the stabilizer doesn't care whether it's a curve or a line. That's interesting, yeah, this is the point. So let's say in a different way. The, 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 what's, a, what's a thing is that now, what is the set of, uh, of uh, lines intersecting a given curve, okay? That's a, a associated Chow variety, yes. okay? And the thing is that the tangent space of this Chow variety is the same as the tangent space of the linearized version of the curve. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's thing. The volume of this Chow variety is a, a multiple of the volume of the original of the Schubert cycle. And by the way, it's this multiple, yes. this normalizing factor. Mm -hmm. And the fact that like, uh, they have the same tangent space allows to uh, prove, use the integral geometry formula in the same way. So the good thing is that like, this way it decouples and pushes all the part coming from the volume in one side. And it, what you're left with is, uh, is this quantity here. Okay, let's stop here.